Praise God, praise God. What an amazing God we serve. Please turn with me over to the Word of God tonight in the book of Philippians. The first chapter of the book of Philippians beginning with verse 12. Amen. Praise the Lord. Went into some archives that have been preached in the past uh, from the book of Philippians and the title of that message at the time was The Martyrdom of Paul. We're going to change it just a little bit, amen, uh, as far as focus is concerned. But if you'll look at Philippians chapter 1 and verse 12, if you have it, say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen and amen. amen. The amazing man of God, the apostle Paul. What an amazing man of God. What a large man. What a man of capacity. The, the capacity of the Apostle Paul is really mind-boggling. All of the pressures that were on him, all of the battles that he went through, everything that he suffered, the wounds that was inflicted upon him, his own personal struggles, and he did have them. Uh, that's why God put a thorn in his flesh. Uh, because he did not want the Apostle Paul to get exalted in pride. So he had personal battles that he was facing uh, at times in his life. But with everything that he had to deal with, he was responsible for many, many churches, etc. He was a great apostle of the Lord. He was just large is all I can say. His capacity is literally mind-boggling what he was able to carry, how he was able to handle things that came to him, even imprisonment that came to him, and the way he looked at that, and the way he uh, focused on that, and the way he saw it is amazing that he had the ability to do that, praise God. And so from him we are inspired tonight also to be able to understand and to see things the way that we should see things. Amen. Praise the Lord. So beginning with verse 12, he says this, But I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. But the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding every way. Say every way. Whether in pretense or in truth. Christ is preached. And I therein do what? Rejoice. rejoice yea and will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation. Through your prayer. And the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also, Christ shall be manifested in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We ask your blessing to be upon the reading of your holy word. We pray for inspiration to declare the word of God tonight. We look to you, God, the author and finisher of our faith, your strength, our anointing, our inspiration to declare your word. God, to preach it and to hear it and receive it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. Thank you for standing. The title of the message tonight is another message on the battle, the battle of the mind. The battle of the mind. 
the gravitas of Paul. The gravitas of Paul. And we'll explain that to you in just a moment. Before we get into that, I want to first of all say to you that there is a struggle at times between your dignity and your depravity. And what I mean by that, when we talk about dignity, we're talking about the image of God that is in us. We were created in His image. That's our dignity. And the image of God in us then would speak of moral, the moral attributes of God that is in us. It speaks of grace. It speaks of mercy. It speaks of walking in love. It speaks of walking in forgiveness. It speaks of walking in holiness. That is the dignity or the image of God. But there is a depraved nature that is on the inside of us that we talked about at the very beginning of this series, The Battle in the Mind. That fallen nature, that depravity in us, creates a struggle with our dignity. And what I mean by that is that sin nature, that fallen nature that is on, on, in the inside of every one of us. There is a race, if you will. For your depravity to outrun your dignity. It is the responsibility of a preacher of the word of God, a pastor, etc. Anybody that preaches the word of God, their focus is to preach the word of God to a congregation. So that, the, that ultimately the depravity does not outrun the dignity. I want you to hear what I just said. Your depravity is trying to outrun your dignity. And there's got to be something that stops that race, if you will, so that we don't yield to the sin nature that is inside of us and the dignity or the image that God has created us and also his power to do his will in, in and through us is not defeated by that depravity. You have to look at life that way that because you have a sin nature in you that that sin nature is trying to get ahead of your dignity. And ultimately destroy who you are in God. Your purpose in God. Your call in God. And so we want to always allow our dignity to be ahead of our depravity. Give the Lord praise in the house. There are great challenges that come. And as a result of this fallen world, there are people who will celebrate depravity over the image of God. And what I mean by that is this, is that there is a desire by the fallen man and by the world as a whole to celebrate that which is against the image of God. And what I mean by that, you, you say you take a young woman, a young girl, she's struggling with her identity. She doesn't, she's not in touch with who she is, you know. She doesn't like the way she looks physically in her body. And so she begins to go through this identity crisis and trying to figure out who she is. It can happen the same way with boys. In fact, it used to be more with boys than it is girls. But now it's more with girls than it is with boys. And what I mean by that is this struggle in those you know, adolescent years, we'll say it, that goes on within, inside of that young man or that young woman, uh, an identity crisis begins to get a hold of them. Now, sometimes there is an atypical gene that is inside of that young woman or that young man. And that comes as a result of the what? Depravity. It comes as a result of the fall of man. So there are genetic genes or genes inside of a person because of that fall those genes can be effective neg affected negatively and on a very rare occasion and I'm saying very rare occasion there is a gene inside of that young man or that young woman that makes them feel like they're a different gender than who they are that is extremely rare. It's atypical. It's not normal. But because of the fallenness of man, that fallen nature affects the genetic genome of the person. So there are some people that are genetically coded very rarely, atypically, and they think that they're a boy when they're a girl or they think they're a girl when they're a boy. 
very rare. Secondar secondarily, there is a, uh, a, a phobia or a phoria that gets a hold of some of them, and it is a psychological battle. That psychological battle is also very rare. They have a battle in their mind, their suko, their, their, their suke, their soul. And so they battle in the soul realm about their identity. Am I a girl or am I a boy, etc., etc. Right, right. If you have a atypical genetic coding in an individual that's affecting them in their identity, then you go to physicians and you talk to physicians and you see what you can do with physicians, etc., to correct that problem. If you have somebody that is struggling psychologically, and I'm talking about severity here, you get counseling involved and you talk to that person uh, and you share with them, you affirm their identity. You let them know we love you. You let them know if you're a girl, you are beautiful. You give them assurance as a parent about who they are, amen, because they may not be feeling very well about themselves. My whole point in saying that is the struggle that goes on can be a genetic problem, very rare, a psychological problem, very rare. But oftentimes it is the culture in which we live. So that right now what is out of the image of God is celebrated. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So let's say a young person that's struggling with their identity. They go to school. When they get to school, they share with a teacher or a counselor. I'm struggling with my identity. And that teacher says, oh, 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 you know, you're really not a boy, you're a girl. And we're going to celebrate that. So what they are doing is they are creating a celebration that goes against the dignity and celebrates the depravity. Did you hear what I said? And oftentimes, brothers and sisters, I'm going to shock you with what I'm about to say. In the school systems, now I haven't heard much in Texas about any of this going on, but in the school systems, if a young person has a struggle with their identity, they can go to a counselor, and that counselor can talk to them about their gender. And oftentimes, they will affirm them and say, you know, you feel like you're a boy, but you're a girl. You're, it's okay if you feel like you're a boy. And they affirm that understanding of depravity. Are you with me here now? Not only that, brothers and sisters, but they can prescribe hormones. Are you with me? They can prescribe hormones without you even knowing about it. That will cause the physical body of the woman to look like a man or the man's body to look like a woman. And you don't have any clue that they did it because legally they don't have to. In fact, they, they, they're not supposed to let the parent know the conversation that they had with the child. Now, again, I say to you, I haven't heard any of that going on in Texas, and I pray it doesn't. But it does take place in, in many places. Legally, they have the right to tell you nothing, even though your child is a minor. And they can prescribe hormones to your children, and you don't even know about it. And it will affect their, uh, their puberty, if you will, uh, in, in a very drastic way. So that later on in life, when they look at it, you know, they say, I'm just going through something then, but I'm, I'm really a girl. I'm not a boy. But see, they have been affected negatively in their puberty by the drugs that were given to them by the school system. And you didn't even know about it. Are you hearing what I'm telling you today? And so then they get on the internet, and on the internet, uh, they will be celebrated uh, for that, uh, you know, that gender identity crisis. And so they find support for all of that from the internet. That's the society that we live in today. We need to affirm our young people. We need to let them know that they're loved. We need to assure them that they are beautiful and we need to talk to them about their gender identity in a way they can understand, praise God. God made you this. You're not a that. 
And again, atypically, genetically, it's possible. Very rare. Psychologically, very rare. But ultimately, brothers and sisters, whatever you got to do, you pray over your children. You talk to them about who they are, who their identity is. Praise God. Amen. Give the word of God to them all the time. Because you're in a battle right now, and some of you don't even realize that that can be done behind your back. And I'm not saying don't send your kids to public school. But there are dangers in certain places in sending them to public school. Because they can do things behind your back you don't even know about. That's the culture that we're living in right now. A celebration of the depraved. A celebration of that which is all messed up. Celebrating things that are not originally made to be like that. God, come on somebody. God made you male and female. He made you a beautiful young woman. He made you a handsome young man. That's who you are, praise God. And you need to embrace that identity and not be ashamed of that identity. You need to embrace your sexuality and not be ashamed of your sexuality because God made you that way. Give the Lord praise in the house. So there is a great battle that goes on in the mind. And and it it is facilitated by the world. And I will tell you the God of this world is behind it. It is a spiritual battle that's, that's taking place right now that's driving it. Do you hear the word of God tonight? Give God praise in the house. But I'm here to inform the church of the living God what goes on behind the scenes. Say praise the Lord, church. But I'm here to tell you that there's an answer in the Word of God. That no matter what your battle is, no matter what you're going through in life, God made you with dignity. God made you in His image. God loves you. God wants to help you. And when you go through battles in your mind or in your life, there is an answer to the problems that you go through. Are you with me right now? Give God praise in the house. Gravitas or gravitas means this, gravity. It means that when you go through battle in your life, if you uh, allow that battle to work for you, and you walk in faith, and you look to God in dignity, you turn to God, and you live the way He wants you to live and be the way He wants you to be, then that depravity will not win in your life. Gravitas means this. It means that what has happened in your life, your soul has become bigger, if you will. You're allowing to what takes place in your soul to gravitate you. So that whatever you go through in life, whatever trouble you face, it can become gravitas. That means that when you go through something, when you need forgiveness and you're forgiven, that creates a bigger soul or a bigger spirit in you. Are you understanding? When you are deeply wounded by something in your life, when you take it to God and you grow through that process, what will happen as your wounds are healed, you are getting bigger in your spirit and bigger in your soul. Your sins are forgiven. Your wounds are healed. You are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And so whatever it is, if it's a thorn in the flesh... That thorn that was in your flesh is now settled deep in your flesh. So what is happening is your soul, everything that you're going through, it can create gravitas in you. It'll make a bigger you inside spiritually than you would have been if you had not gone through it. But you have to look to God in the time of your trouble. When you, have, when you come short and you sin against God, you turn to God in that time. If you're wounded in your soul, you turn to God and say, Lord, I'm trusting you to take this and to make me spiritually attractive. Like gravity is attractive. I want you to make me attractive spiritually. 
the more you go through and the more you take it to God and focus on God, if you allow that to happen, you will become more attractive. It's like gravity, gravitos. You become more attractive because your spirit, your soul is becoming dynamic in God. Oh, has he healed your wounds today? If God healed your wounds, shout praises to the Lord. If you've gone through something in your life and you've made it through, but now you know you're a bigger person than what you were before because you went to God with it, praise the Lord. What you're saying in every battle is I'm not looking for a reason to backslide. I'm going to trust my God no matter what I go through. Some people today are looking for a reason to backslide. Oh, no, no, no. Whatever I go through, God, let me see through to you, Lord. Let me take it to you, God. Let me consider you, Lord, and you will heal me. You will deliver me. You will forgive me. You will make me what I need to be. So that ultimately, when you go through a lot, if you handle it correctly and you go to God with it, it's making you a bigger person on the inside, spiritually gravitos. You are becoming more attractive, not less attractive. You're like gravity. And listen to what I'm about to say. You can become so big spiritually. You can have so much of God inside of you. That no matter what you go through, because of the amount of God that you have inside of you, and the size of your spirit, and the size of your soul, it is so much bigger than even your body can contain it. God will use that to largeness to come, and you'll become more attractive in the work of the living God, because you are willing to go through that process. Everybody give God praise in the house. What a mighty God he is. Oh, Jesus, if I have the ability to see through my problem, if I have the ability to see through my pain, my wounds, even sometimes my failures, if I have the ability to look uh, to God at all times, then what happens is I'm getting bigger. Now, God doesn't always allow stuff to come to us for personal growth. Sometimes it's for the furtherance of the gospel. But ultimately, whatever his purpose is, you have to have a mindset. I say a mindset that sees beyond what you're going through. Lord Jesus, you've got a purpose for what I'm going through right now. And I'm looking to you, the author and the finisher of my faith. Amen. You may be seated just for a moment. When we talk about the mind, I want you to understand something. When I say the mind, what do you think I'm talking about today? I'm not talking about your brain. Are you with me right now? You know, if it was just a brain problem, uh, maybe we could go and get brain surgery and get a brain transplant. Have you ever been there before? You say, Lord, I need a brain transplant. And you say, well, pastor, is that possible? I, theoretic, theoretically, it is possible to have a brain transplant. It's a very technical process. You know what I'm saying? But sometimes we think, man, I just need a brain transplant. Hallelujah. Oh, you with me now? And, and some of us even talk about a full head transplant. I said, some of us, hallelujah. And you say, Pastor, I just don't think that's possible to have a head transplant. Well, brothers and sisters, uh, theoretically, it is possible to have a head transplant. There was a doctor that took the head of a live monkey and put it on the, head, the cutoff head of another donkey, uh, uh, monkey. And the monkey survived for many days until the body rejected the head. But you could have a brain transplant. You could have a head transplant, praise God. You could go to Dr. Frankenstein. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. And get a new brain and a new head. But there's a problem with that because that's not the mind. The mind is your inner self. The mind is your soul and your spirit. Your mind is in here inside of you, praise God. It's called your soul. So when you talk about your mind biblically, you're talking about your will, your emotions, the seat of your judgment, where you make choices deep down inside of you. Are you understanding? 
So there are times when your mind is going through sorrow. I'm not talking about your brain. I'm talking about the inner self. Emotionally, you're feeling sad, you know. Are y'all awake tonight? Or you're making a choice in your life. Something going on there. What is it? Where's it coming from? Well, is it not just, it's not just coming from your brain. It starts in your mind. Say your mind. Your mind, your soul, mind, will, emotions. All of that's the deep inner person, the invisible soul, the spirit person that's inside of your body. Do you understand what I'm saying? So what happens is... Uh, the choices that you make, judgments that you make, feelings that you have start in your inner self, your soul, not here. They don't start here. This, your brain is your body. This is your body, but your brain is your body. What happens is when you have a feeling, whatever that emotion might be, or you're making a choice, Whatever that might be, it starts in your mind, in your soul. Then from there, that registers with the physical, the brain. And the brain interprets what's going on in the soul and transmits that information to the body. So it starts here. It starts in your inner man. Your inner man sends the signal to the brain, not the other way around. Your brain doesn't send a signal to your inner man about how you should feel or etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It starts in your inner man. And the good news is that your inner man can be transformed. Your inner man can be changed. I'm not talking about a head transplant or a brain transplant. I'm talking about in your soul. Your feelings, your emotions, your choices, your decisions, your judgments can be changed in the inner man by what? The Word of God and the Spirit of God. I'm transformed here inside of me. Amen. So you say, well, there's just something wrong with me. There's something wrong with my mind. There's something wrong with my body. May not be at all anything wrong with you. Praise the Lord God. Your spirit, though, your soul, you understand what I'm trying to preach to you, sends a signal to your brain. Okay, you're not feeling happy. You're sad. You're trying to make a choice. Sends a signal to the brain. The brain interprets that and then sends it to the body and says to the body, this is the way you respond. What the body does with what the brain tells it came from the mind, not the brain. <clears throat> and then the body manifests what's going on in the inside of you. <clears throat> Everybody awake tonight. <clears throat> Do you understand what I just said? So you can get a brain transplant, a, a full head transplant. They call it a full body transplant if you get a brain transplant. But guess what? You still got your soul. You still got that innermost part of you that is your will, your emotions, the seat of your judgment where you make choices, praise God. What are you going to do about that? Praise the Lord. Now, having said that, I will, I will turn back this way, and it will sound like I'm contradicting with what I just said. Your mind can affect your inner self. And I say your mind, your brain can affect your mind and your body can affect your mind as well for example if you take medicine for heart condition that medicine can make you feel down that didn't come from your innermost mind it came from a physical response of your body so that your body is sending are you with me this feeling of I'm down but your spirit or your soul is going, I'm not down. In my soul or my mind, my spirit, I'm fine. I feel great. But the body, the medicine, makes you feel down. But because you're no, in your soul, I'm, I have peace with God. Lord, I don't know what, what's, what's going on here, but I feel down right now, but I, I don't have a reason to be down. That's medicine. So you're, what you're, if your body's sick, 
We are one being. I want you to understand, but we have parts of our being. We're one being, and they all work together. So if your body's physically sick, it affects your mind, and your mind affects your innermost being. Your, your, the brain affects your mind. Amen. You get the point right now. So there's a lot of complexities here that we try to look at when we're trying to figure out what's going on with us. But I'm going to make it simple tonight. We're going to focus on God. So I took medicine. No, I didn't, but I'm just giving an example. You take medicine for a heart condition so you feel down. That's not your, inner, that's not your mind. That's your body affecting your mind. Hormones. You start having hormonal problems. You know what I'm saying? Maybe, God help me tonight to... Jesus, and I'm not just talking to the women tonight, hallelujah. The hormone situation that's going on in you can affect your innermost being. Everybody awake? Hey, maybe you got too much going on, too much hormone. Maybe not enough hormone. So they put you on hormone all of a sudden, right? Wow, you find out that that hormone, that medication is affecting your body your mind, your brain, and your innermost being. Say, praise the Lord. Say, you drink caffeine. Caffeine is a drug. I'm not saying don't drink caffeine, but I'm telling you, it's a drug. So you drink caffeine, you're feeling pretty good, you know, no anxiety, but all of a sudden you drink uh, 600 grams of, uh, of caffeine, brother, hallelujah, and all of a sudden you get the jitters, and you start getting anxiety. Amen. And maybe you cry like a baby. Well, that caffeine is a drug. So my point is that you can have influences by your body if it's sick or if it's medications that can cause you to feel certain ways. That it's, but it's not who you are inside of you. Say praise the Lord, church. Ultimately tonight, having said all of that, and you really didn't even want to hear it, but I gave it to you anyway, because we think it all comes from here, but it don't. It comes from here first. Are you all awake? Because you are not a materialistic kind of a person only. You are not materialistically, are you all with me here, determined. And what I mean by that is it's not, you're not just a body working around with a bunch of chemicals. You're made up more than just chemicals of your brain or hallelujah to the Lamb. And that's the problem today with certain psychologists or psychiatrists. They will deal with the physical man. You with me? Mechanical determinism. They look at you as just a person made up of chemicals. So if we could treat the chemical in that person, if we could change the chemical in that person, then we've got them cured. They fail to understand that you are much more than mechanically determined. You're much more than chemicals. You're much more than all of those physical attributes. You are a spirit. You have a soul and a body. But all of it works together. But I want to start tonight with the mind. I want to start tonight with, we talk about the battle of the mind. We've been preaching about all that. And we didn't even know what the mind was. But I'm starting there tonight, here, in your soul, your spirit, the invisible side of you. Your feelings, your emotions, the way you think, your judgments, your choices are in your soul. And we need our soul to be transformed. We need to have the ability to change our mind about the way that we look at things in life. Because we want them to work for us and not against us. Is everybody awake? Okay, I already, I already feel that I have lost y'all completely. But Paul was a kind of man who had the ability to connect with God in his innermost being. He knew that God was on the throne, not just out there on another, uh, uh, the other half of the universe. He knew that God was on the throne inside of him. Is everybody awake? 
and that it didn't matter what he went through, he always centered in on God. And he got larger and larger and larger spiritually. And it is so, so that pretty soon he's more spiritual and more, are you with me right now, than his body. He's bigger than his body. His capacity is amazing. He is so large because he's gone through so many things. His wounds are healed. His sins forgiven. He's redeemed by the blood. And he did not let life destroy him or defeat him. Nor did he let the devil, when the devil came against him, to try to destroy him or the work of God. He did not focus on that. He saw through to God. He didn't say there's another God in the universe. He said there's one God. And I preach that one God. And I have to see everything I'm going through in the light of that. Because if you don't, what will happen if you are a person, you go to the psychologist. I need a psychologist to help me. So you go to the psychologist. And if they're not a Bible, a Bible, biblical counselor that approaches it this, you know, this way biblically, then that person will sit down and say, we need to put you on drugs so we can fix you. Or it's your environment. Or it's who your mama was. Or it's who your daddy was. See? And oh, are y'all with me right now? Praise God. Oh, Jesus. And I, there's a place for that. If there, there's a problem there, I get the point there. But I'm trying to show you tonight that no matter what you go through, you can become gravitas. Which means you can get so large and so big spiritually that you become attractive. Instead of repelling people, you become attractive. God, there's so much of God inside of you that you become attractive spiritually to the people around you. Give the Lord praise in the house. So my, my, my wounds are not destroying me. Now are you understanding what I'm saying today? All right, praise God. When we go through the word of God, we see this great man has this ability to do this. He's in prison in Rome. Say, in prison in Rome. If he were to look at the natural only, he would say, what in the world is going on here? I'm sitting in a prison cell in Rome for preaching the gospel. How can that possibly be that this man of God serving God and preaching the gospel ends up in a prison cell in Rome? How is it possible that the greatest voice in that day for the gospel is silenced? How can it be that God would allow his apostle to be put in prison no longer able to preach from city to city. His voice is silenced. It looks like failure everywhere. It looks like it's all wrong. Are you understanding? From the natural viewpoint, if he let his mind, his brain start looking at it, he would say, this is a mess. I'm not able to preach anymore. I'm in a prison here. My voice has been shut out. This can't be God. This is impossible that this could be God. But he doesn't do that. He goes with his mind a different direction. He doesn't let his mind become downcast, depressed, and discouraged by what he sees naturally. He sees through all of his troubles, all of his problems, his captivity, his imprisonment, the shutting up of his mouth, his inability to preach the gospel from city to city. He sees through that to God's purpose in his life. And he becomes gravitos. That means large. I want to preach to you tonight, don't be a little person. Don't be a little man. Don't be a little woman. Don't be a little young person. Get big in God. Get, 
get so much of God that no matter what you go through, you have the ability to see through it all. And say, God is in absolute total control. Everything is not his will, but everything is under his control. We'll just leave it at that for right now. That's a big doctrine. But I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, if we see through to God, we won't understand everything. We can't imagine that we would be in the situation that we're in. We don't like it. We want God to do it, you know, a different way. And we want something to be different in our lives. But God says, I put you there. We have to be able to see that with our mind. I'm not talking about our eyes physically. I'm not talking about your brain up here. Your great man. I'm talking about seeing it from inside here. The spirit man. So when we look at Paul, that's exactly what he does. So he says in verse 12. But I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Now, you can imagine the church in Philippi, they're over there praying, oh, Lord God, get Paul out. We need Paul. We need Paul to help us. We need Paul to be able to preach. Oh, Lord, we don't understand. This can't be your will, God. It's impossible that this is your will, God. You can imagine what the prayer life would be like there in the church of Philippi. They would be telling God, God, this isn't your will. And they'd be trying to tell God how to do it. They would say, God, you need to fix this. Because this is just not right that this great man of God would be shut up. So you can hear the prayer that would be prayed for Paul. Get him out, God. Oh, God, this is not your will. How is this possible, God, that this great man is shut up from preaching the gospel? So you can hear them praying, right? Oh, and they're telling God how to do it. They're telling God how to fix it, you know. Praise God. And in their minds, they think they got it right. But this little preacher, little bald-headed preacher with real close eyes. Are you with me now? Tradition says he was a little bit humpbacked. He was short. He was bald-headed. He had these little beady eyes that were closely set together. Are you with me right now? He was so narrow-minded, you could put out both eyes with one, one bullet, one, one baby, hallelujah. And you would think that he had such a, he would be powerful in physique, you know, and uh, praise the Lord God. <laughs> totally different than what we understand him to be. And not only that, but he had a squeaky little voice. Yeah, you would think he would have a powerful, booming voice. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm not going there. I am so tempted right now. But he didn't. He had this squeaky little voice, little short hump back, a little bit humped over, you know, praise God. Ball-headed little preacher, you know, praise God. But the power that was in that man, the gravitas that, the gravitas that was in that man, the largest of that man's spirit, the largest of his capacity, overwhelming, praise God. And here he is sitting in that prison. If he's not careful, he can let his mind go there. And say, Lord God, this is not your will. And, you know, Lord God, I need you to fix this. I need you to get me out by tomorrow. I need you to come and rescue me, God. Because, you know, I should be out there preaching right now. But that's not what he did. He took his mind, his innermost being... And he focused it on the Spirit of God. He saw God sitting on his throne inside of him and said, Lord God, you would not allow me to be here today if it wasn't you who put me here. And we don't understand that. So he says this, but I would you should understand. Brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Where's his mind right now? His mind is the furtherance of the gospel. Whoo, hallelujah. He said, that's why I'm where I'm at. 
It doesn't make sense that the greatest preacher of his day is locked up. But Paul says it's actually causing the gospel to be furthered. Ooh, you got to have a big spirit. You got to have a big soul. You got to have a lot of God inside of you. When you're sitting in that position, in that dungeon, possibly, it's, it depends on, we don't know for sure exactly, but historically, the Apostle Paul could have been in a dungeon under Nero's palace at this time. It could be that he was uh, in house arrest in the barracks of the, the Praetorium Guard, which was the emperor's bodyguard. Either way, he was under the Praetorium Guard. Rather, whether or not he was under Pharaoh's, um, uh, Nero's palace in a dungeon, or if he was in the barracks of the Praetorian Guard, there he sat. Everybody with me now? And he looks up and he says, this is for the furtherance of the gospel. Nobody would have understood that. He said, what's happening to me right now is that there's obstacles that are being removed for the church. Because the word furtherance of the gospel means obstacles are being removed. How is it him sitting in a prison can cause the obstacles to the gospel and to the church to be removed? I'm going to show you. He's got a mind that's focusing in on God. Okay, you ever been there? Oh, Lord, would you fix this? Lord, God, this isn't right. This isn't your will. And I know there are some things that are not right. I'm talking about this, though. Lord, I want you to fix it. I want you to do it like this. So you spend all your time telling God how to do it. And you get the church to pray. Lord God, let's church, let's pray that God would do this this way. Because certainly this cannot be God's will. Really? Unless you see through to God and say, Lord, you're in control of everything. So that maybe what I'm going through is for the furtherance of the gospel. So, amen, praise God. The obstacles are being removed. He goes on, he says, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and all others. He looked at his chains. And I, I'm asking you, if you had chains on your wrist and you were in that cell in the bottom of Nero's palace or the barracks of the Praetorium Guard, and you look down at those shackles and they've got Rome stamped on them. You would say, maybe, and I might say, I'm imprisoned by Rome. Paul says, I'm in bonds in Christ. I'm not a prisoner of Rome. I'm not a prisoner of Nero. I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. What he's saying, God put me in prison. And the reason why he put me in prison is because the gospel is going to be furthered. Do you see what I'm saying? So he goes on and he says, my bonds in Christ, not Rome, are manifest in all the palace. And so we don't understand it. But Paul, the praetorium guard, the emperor's bodyguard, was chained to Paul 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And this little preacher sitting in that prison house, either the barracks of the Praetorian Guard or in a dungeon below Nero's palace. Here comes the, bodies, the bodyguard of the emperor. And they sit down by this little Jewish preacher that's large inside. And are you with me? Hallelujah. And this little preacher... You know, he begins to pray, but he doesn't pray silently because Jews don't pray silently. Amen. So he's next to this, this bodyguard, you know, this pagan, if you will. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Amen. And this pagan, look at Paul, say, hey, Paul, what you in for? And Paul say, I'm in for my God. 
And the emperor's bodyguard would shake their head, say, you can't be in here for God because nobody goes to jail for their God. Not in this culture. Rome was full of gods and nobody went to jail for their gods. But Paul would say, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I'm a prisoner of my God. What are you talking about? That's impossible. You with me? But he would get to be praying and he would witness to him. And he'd say, hey, there's only one God. What'd you say? What you in here for? My God. What? What's his name anyway? It's not Jupiter. No, Jesus. And it's not Nero. <clears throat> it's Jesus. So the bodyguard, did you say there's one God? And did you say his name's Jesus? Yes. Uh, tell me more. Well, he died for your sin. He died for my sin. Yeah. He died for your sin. He rose again the third day. He ascended to sit on the right hand of God. He's on his throne today. He's the true King of kings and Lord of lords. There is no other God but Jesus Christ. And he is your Savior, your only King, your only Redeemer. And the rains would come in the rainy season. And the rains would fill up the dungeon beneath Nero's palace. And Paul would baptize those guards in Jesus' name. So that one by one, the guards walked out. And they went up into the, are you with me? We already read it to you. It reached all the way up into the palace. One by one, they went up there and they said, I'm a Jesus believer now. I believe in one God. Hallelujah. And this happened for two solid years. And they, historians say that literally thousands of the Praetorian Guard, the bodyguard of the emperor, were baptized in Jesus' name. It went all the way up into the highest echelons, into the emperor's palace. And eventually Paul would preach to Nero himself. Oh, that can't be God, but it is. And so time went by. And these, these bodyguards walked out and they would see somebody in the street and they would say, let me tell you about one God and his name is Jesus. He died, was buried, uh, rose again the third day. He is our Savior. He's the only true King. And the people that they would witness to would say, uh, I know him. Then why didn't you tell me about him? Why is it this little bald-headed preacher with little squinty eyes that has a little squeaky voice, he's the one that preached to us when we were chained to him. We walked by you daily and you didn't say a word. Now I'm about to say something that's maybe going to contradict what I just said. But in that early church, brothers and sisters, there was no such thing as a Christian that did not witness. No such thing. The word witness means to be a martyr. And everybody preached Jesus Christ. If you were a New Testament believer, you got off of your pew and you spread the gospel, even though it might mean that you might be put to death because there was no such thing as a Christian that didn't witness. And so the friends of Paul would show up at the jail and they would say, hey, Paul, isn't it amazing to serve this one God named Jesus? And the, and the guards would go, who? And they would get converted. And then the emperor sent them throughout the whole world. Because the Bible said it didn't just reach up into the palace of Nero. The Bible said it reached in other places. And by 61 AD, the praetorium guard, the, the bodyguard of the emperor, would be sent all over Europe. 
and that bodyguard preached the gospel of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They went to England and preached. They went to Scotland and preached. They went all over Europe and preached the gospel. That's how Paul said this was the will of God. Say praise the Lord church. Even to this day over in Europe, there's the symbol of the fish, which speaks of Christianity that dates way, way back. Give God praise in the house. And not only that, but he would sit there and he would witness to them about this one God named Jesus. Baptize him in Jesus' name. He would pray out loud. Oh, hallelujah. Because he had so much God he converted basically the CIA. He's like Brother Jerry getting thrown in prison for preaching the gospel. They put the CIA, connect, you know, chained the CIA to Brother Jerry. And he preaches to him, and they just start getting baptized in Jesus' name until basically the whole CIA comes to the Lord. And it wouldn't be because Jerry would silently pray, Lord Jesus. Lord, thank you for this meal that I'm about to eat, God. No, Paul lifted up his voice in prayer like any Jew would. When he read his Bible in public, he didn't read it like this. He would say, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, chained to a Roman guard, chained to the bodyguard of the emperor, he prayed out loud. He preached out loud. He read his Bible out loud. And one by one, that powerful little preacher who had so much of God in him, he gravitated to them, became attracted to them. Ultimately, it was Jesus that was the gravitos of Paul. Give God praise in the house. And so, and not only that, but while he's in prison, see, God said, I got to stop you, Paul. You're going from city to city. You're preaching the gospel. But I got to stop you, Paul, because I need you to write some letters. And so while he was in prison, he wrote the letters of Colossians and the church of Philippians. And he wrote that letter. And he wrote a letter to Philemon. And all these letters, brothers and sisters, that we read for thousands of years, millions of people have been affected by the letters that Paul wrote in prison. If he was not stopped by God and put in prison and made a prisoner, you wouldn't have your Bible today. This man had a faith that was dynamic. This faith was, his, this man was large in his soul, large in his spirit. His capacity was amazing to spread the gospel. And you know, at the beginning, there, there's got to be some battle going on in his mind, you know, in his soul. You know, at the beginning, until he saw into God's purpose in his life. Why would that bother him? If he got shut up because he was a busy man. When you study, there's a, there's a commentary I read years ago. I read the whole, comment, uh, whole commentary on the book of Acts by B.H. Carroll. And I want to tell you how I read it, but don't tell anybody, even though I'm putting it on video. Shh. They can't come get me, though. Hallelujah. Because they didn't catch me. But on my job... I would have to go deliver filters out of town, maybe, you know, a six-hour drive or whatever, three hours up and three hours back. And I'd deliver those filters all over the gas plants, all over this area. And while I was driving, I said, you know what? I'm not going to waste my time behind the steering wheel. I'm going to read a commentary. So I brought my B.H. Carroll with me. I pulled it out of the console, and I read the whole commentary in the book of Acts going down the road. I'm not saying you should do that. In fact, I encourage you not to read while you're driving. But I had such an insatiable hunger for the Word of God. I said, you know what? I'm going to read, the, I'm going to read this commentary. And I read that commentary driving down the road. Now, don't you do that. Do you? I'm telling them not to do that, but that's what I did. Amen. 
And B.H. Carroll made a statement. It's one of the greatest commentaries I've read, ever read on the book of Acts. He said this, Paul was a man that was focused on not landscape, but manscape. Everywhere he went, he looked for an, uh, some opportunity to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Whether it's in a prison house, wherever he was, he was a preacher. So you can imagine when he gets shut up in prison. A man that traveled, literally, Brother Dice, taught a series on the book of Acts. He said this, the Apostle Paul, and I said in Brother, Brother Dice's Acts series, he said Paul traveled 12,000 miles land and sea, and he didn't have a jet. He didn't have a personal plane. He walked, and he rode boats to spread this gospel. 12,000 miles, say praise. So you can imagine what he must have been going through in his mind if he's sitting in that prison. But he saw through to God. And he said, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He said, you need to understand something, church. While you're praying, God, get him out. God, fix it. He said, oh, no. Because ultimately, if it was God's will for me to get out, I would be out. But if it's God's will for me not to get out... There's nothing you can do to get me out. I'm going to say that again. You need to hear what I'm saying, what I'm preaching to you. If God says no, there's nothing anybody can do to get him out of jail. But if God says get out of jail, there's nothing nobody can do to keep him in jail. Because God is ultimately in control. His mind... Here, saw through to God. Verse 14, and many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Praise God. Oh, it encouraged and inspired uh, the brethren to go out and preach the word of God. They were already preaching to a certain extent. But now they've got a boldness. They've got a confidence in their mind. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah, look at what Paul was doing. Let's go preach. Let's go win souls. Let's go witness like we've never witnessed before. Because we know if we witness, and Paul hears about us witnessing and the gospel spreading, that it will encourage that man of God while he's sitting in prison for the gospel. And they wanted to be an encouragement to the man of God. And so they were inspired to go and witness, to preach like they had never preached before, to witness like they had never witnessed before. Are you a soul winner tonight? I want to be inspired tonight by Paul, and I am. The focus now, even on the brethren, their waxing confidence by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. And then verse 15, he talks about some personal challenges of ministry. And here's what he said. He said, some are preaching Christ, even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I'm set for the de de defense of the gospel. Amen. Now, what was his response to that? He's got people that are preaching. And notice, he goes on and he says he rejoices in that. That means that they're not preaching false doctrine. Because if they were preaching false doctrine, he couldn't rejoice in that. But his mind, his mind here is rejoicing as he sees people preaching the truth. But they're wrong as a person. There are people that preach the word of God and it's, they know the truth and they preach the truth. The problem is they're wrong in, them per, in their person. And so Paul says, I've got some people here. They preach the gospel and it's for strife and contention. And they're trying to add to my afflictions. What do you mean, Paul? They didn't like Paul for some reason. The Bible doesn't tell us why they didn't like him, but they didn't like him. And so when Paul is shut up in prison, you know, they add, there's an attitude now. Oh, it's competition. Oh, Paul, we don't like him anyway. And so now is our opportunity to build a big church without Paul. 
So they would preach the gospel. They would preach the truth. But they were wrong in their persons. It was all about competition. It was all about being competitive. It was all, it was selflessly motivated. And Paul knew it. And I'm going to tell you, brother and sister, and I've said this before, the same way it is today in many churches. They preach the gospel and it's the truth, but their motive is wrong. And they're wrong as a person. Anybody that steals church members out of another church, even if they preach the gospel, they're wrong as a person. Amen? But you know what Paul did when he saw all that going on? He said, they're trying to add to my pain. They're trying to add to my suffering. That's why they preach, you know. Well, I rejoice, said Paul, that the gospel is being preached. They're wrong as a person, but the message they're preaching is the truth. Give God praise in the house. And it happens all the time. Even in Jesus' name churches. The authority of those churches They don't say anything to their congregations about going over here and trying to peel off people out of another church. Are you with me? Because if that leadership did that, the people wouldn't do it. Are you with me? But Paul looked at all of that and he said, you know what? I realize they're wrong in their motive. They're wrong in their person. But the message is being preached. And he says, I can see through all of that jealousy and strife and all of that competition I can see through all of that and I can rejoice that Jesus Christ is preached what an amazing man of God give the Lord a hand clap of praise the one preached Christ of contention not sincerely supposing and affliction to my bonds amen but he's still happy Try to discourage him, but he's still happy because he's got his mind on God. You know, oh, Jesus. Help us, Lord God, not to be like this. Constantly up and down. Let us have gravitas inside of us. So much of God that no matter where we find ourselves in life, we can see through our troubles to God. We can see through our problems to God. Oh, this is an opportunity. God is in control. I'm going to center in on God in my mind. And so he goes on, but the other of love, knowing that I'm set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And I therefore do what? Rejoice, yea, and I will rejoice. While he's in a prison cell, the book of Philippians is the book of rejoicing. If he let his mind go off, he wouldn't be rejoicing. No, he's focused on God. Whew. Yeah, see, here, if I'm not careful, I'm going to preach right over your head. And what I mean by that is that you can't reach it. See, right now, some of you have completely shut this message off because you don't see the ability to be like Paul. And to reach that. It's in the word of God to inspire us. Are you with me? And I'm going to say it like this. Stop sucking your thumb. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Are you with me right now? You see through to God. You get busy for God. You serve God. No matter what is in your life. No matter what's come to you. If you're... If you're disappointed or whatever you have to say this is God's will for my life and I would like for him to change it and fix it and do it a different way and I'm going to pray that he does but I'm not going there because I don't have pagan faith pagan faith says I want it you do it my way and if you don't do it my way God And you begin to resent God. Because he didn't do it your way. Or the way you thought it should be. 
So you start resenting God. You start resenting the church. And pretty soon you find a way to backslide. That's pagan faith. Pagan faith is I want it my way. I want what I want. And if I don't get it, I'm leaving the church. But true biblical faith says, I put my trust in my God. I rest in my God. A lot of churches today, they focus on pagan faith. And that's why there's such a mess today. No, we have to trust in the Lord. Amen. Okay. Woo. What then notwithstanding, every way, whether in presence or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, I will rejoice, for I know that this shall turn to my salvation. What amazing faith. Everything, if you look at it in the natural, everything says failure. Everything says it's a mess. Everything says this is not God. How can this be God? But yet he says, I know, I know, my mind, I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Did you hear what the man just said? He said, God meant this, he said, first of all, the furtherance of the gospel. Number two, it inspired the church. It removed obstacles. It got the church off the pew in the streets, winning souls like they're supposed to. Are you understand? They are encouraged by him. And then we see now that he is saying, this is going to turn to my salvation. When I read that, that shocks me. It's going to turn to your salvation. What do you mean, Paul? Well, ultimately, he means his deliverance. But when he talks about salvation or deliverance, he's not telling God how that should work. He said, if I die or I live, the most important thing is that Jesus Christ is magnified in my life. He's not in pagan faith. Oh, God, get me out of here tomorrow. He said, if I die, it's in your will. If I die, Lord God... It's to my deliverance and to my salvation. I'm going to be delivered one way or the other, Paul said. But when I look at this, he says, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. I want you to listen very carefully. God put him in that prison to save him. God put him in that jail cell to deliver him. Are you with me? He said, this is going to produce my salvation. The actual wording is, this shall turn to my salvation. There are certain things that God literally puts you in assignments that don't, they're not what you want. But if you're not put there, you won't be saved. And you're sitting there, God, get me out of here. And God says, if I get you out of here, you'll be lost. Did you hear what I said? That's why trusting in God ultimately is so important. Now, what, 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 what could be? Where was mine before this? Where was Paul's mind before he was put in jail? With this great capacity that he's walking in now. Well, we know that Paul made a, a personal testimony. He said this. He said that, that God gave him a thorn in the flesh. A messenger of Satan sent to buffet Paul. Why? He said, lest I be exalted above measure because of the revelation that was given to me. He said, there was a messenger of Satan sent to me to buffet me. What was that all about? Lest I be exalted above measure? Paul is saying, pride could have got a hold of me if God didn't send the messenger to buffet me. I don't know what Paul was ultimately battling that he needed to be saved from. But it could have been because of what he said in other places, pride. 
Now, I know that's hard for you and I to grasp if this man would have a, a struggle with pride, but he was human. And he said, God sent a, put a thorn in his flesh to keep him humble. Could it be that God said, I'm stopping you right now, Paul. I need to stop you right now, put you in jail. Because you need to be saved. What was he going through before this happened to him? Was he full of ego? Was he full of pride? Amen. See, psychologically speaking, talk about the mind. People talk about self-esteem. Esteem means the measure that you measure yourself by. We are not in self-esteem. We don't sit around and measure ourselves or appraise ourselves. We get to God. Because ego can cause you to be lost. Because you get a bigger estimation of who you are. Your appraisal of yourself is larger than it should be. Is that why God put this man in prison? Is he, would, he, would he struggle with pride? Are you with me? And I'm not saying. I'm just talking about his testimony. Could it be that Paul, before he got put in jail, is it possible that Paul might have been thinking about another road? I'm not saying he did. But Paul, out of his own mouth, says, this will turn to my salvation. So whatever he was going through in his mind before he got put in prison by the Lord, it ultimately turned out to be his salvation. Maybe God delivered him from pride. We don't know. Maybe God delivered him from even backsliding. We don't know. But God... Listen to me. Some of y'all are so young, you've never been through anything. When I talk about tests and trials, I'm not talking to you, Tim. I'm saying you don't even know what I'm talking about. You don't have a clue, you know, because your test and trial is a boyfriend or a girlfriend that you don't have. Oh, God. You don't have a clue. About a real test or a real trial. Amen. Your test or trial is when you get up in the morning, you pray to God, you don't have a zit on your nose. And if you got a zit on your nose, it's the end of the world. And you're having a great test. <laughs> Say praise the Lord. Now, hey, Jesus. You don't need pagan faith. All right? Everybody with me? Amen. So, and I went through all that because so I kind of know what I'm talking about, you know. Uh, yeah, I shared a testimony in the Martyr of Paul message. I, testimony, you know, they lined us up in a, in a prayer line and i building up my faith. That's pagan faith. I'm building up my faith. I'm believing God. God's going to heal me today of this acne that I have. And I'm sitting there and I'm talking to my faith and I'm talking to myself the whole time. You're going to get healed right now of this acne. If it's to get prayed for, you're going to get healed. And I talked to myself. And if I didn't have faith, I kept talking to my faith so I would have faith. <laughs> and I walked up there. And I, okay, here he comes. They prayed for me. And I walked away with my acne. And it stayed there. <laughs> and I eventually had to go to a doctor. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But that was a major test for me. I mean, that was the end of the world. Y'all, some of y'all can relate anyway. But sometimes we talk about tests and trials. They ain't not test, no test, no trial. Amen. No, no. But when a real test or a real trial comes, do you focus on God and say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. That means, God, I would like it a different way, but it's out of your will. So let your will be done. Lord God, you are wise. and Lord, maybe you put me in this difficult place to save me because I didn't know that I had that in me. I needed to get rid of some stuff that I didn't even know was there. But, God, you allowed me to go through it. Even what the devil meant to destroy you with. 
God said, I give the devil a permission slip sealed with the blood. Which means some God, sometimes God allows the devil, his purpose is to destroy. But God gives him the permission slip sealed in the blood and said, you can only go this far and no further. You have to understand that even if the devil came against you to destroy you, God had a purpose to save you in that. We have to change our mind the way we see things in life. For I know this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer. And the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. He focused on Jesus Christ. He focused on the Word of God. He focused on prayer. He focused on the Spirit. And that's where he got his victory. Do you have anything in you tonight, enough in you tonight to get you through your trouble? Do you have enough faith inside of you? I'm not talking about pagan faith that says if you do it this way, I'll keep serving you. I'm talking about when it all falls apart, you've got something inside of you that's going to keep you going. Give the Lord praise in the house. Paul did. Paul did. According to my earnest expectation and my hope, he had a hope even in prison. Had a hope. I want to say this to you, brothers and sisters. If you ever get to a place where you don't have hope, you don't have faith. Because hope and faith are companions to each other. If you say, I'm hopeless, that means you have no faith. Because if you have faith, you will always have hope. It's the way you see things in your mind. Amen. He goes, I've got an earnest expectation. And my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified where? In my body. Not just in his spirit, but in his body. That means his brain. His physical body. The way he thinks. Everything. Ultimately, what is it about? That Jesus Christ would be magnified. To God be the glory. Whether it be by life or by death. For me to live is Christ and die is gain. It's in your hands, God. I'm trusting you. God, help us as a church. Because we are so emotional from here. And we, listen, are we really walking by faith? We have a bad day. Man, it affects, are we large enough in our spirit? Is God so big inside of us that no matter what we go through, we see through to God and worship Him and say, Lord, you have a purpose in this. You're in control of everything, God. We're giving it to you. Give the Lord praise in the house. When your mind says you're losing, you have to refocus your mind. When your mind says it's all over, you have to refocus your mind. I'm talking about in here. You have to see God. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Put it to you this way. For me to live is Christ and to suffer. Because the whole book of Philippians deals with a suffering church. And they look at Paul, a suffering man. And Paul's over here rejoicing. And Paul is saying by example to the church, this is what you do in suffering. You rejoice. For me to live is Christ and suffer. For me to live is Christ and have trouble. For me to live is Christ and sometimes be disappointed. Are you understanding? But to die is gain. Beautiful, isn't it? So the inward, the inner self. Man, God is developing us. And God didn't do this for Paul's personal growth, but of course... He grew by it. So, and we look at this, and I'm going to just very quickly say this to you. Before I came in the pulpit, God quickened into my spirit the story of the Shunammite. In 2 Kings chapter 4, the Shunammite, the, the great prophet Elisha, comes into her life. 
And the Shunammite prepared him a little chamber, a bed to sleep in at night, a little chamber, a personal pro- prophet's chamber, and probably a table for him to eat on and a place to put his uh, light to study by and, and a place to pray in her house, a chamber for the prophet. He walks into her life and he says, you're going to have a child. And she was barren. And she said, don't play games with me, prophet. Don't tell me something that's not going to happen. Don't play, I'm, I'm paraphrasing in my own words. Don't play games with me, prophet. And the Bible says miraculously she had a son. And right after she had that son, I don't know how much time went by, this son dies. And as he dies, he says, my head, my head. And he dies. And that woman of God says to her husband, he said, you get the servants to saddle up my travel. You get them to saddle up the asses because I'm going to go see the man of God. I got to find the man of God in my life. And they saddled up the asses and she traveled. And, and so the question ultimately was to her. She walked into her husband when her boy is dead. And she tells the servants, so you go tell my husband it is well. She's got a dead boy on her hands who cried, my head, my head. Probably a sunstroke. He's dead. But she says, you tell my husband it's well. Saddle up the ass as she rides hard and fast to the man of God. Get me to the man of God. She gets to the man of God and the man of God. God doesn't show the prophet what she's going through. He doesn't know what has happened because God doesn't show it to him. The man of God sends his servant and says, Hey, go ask the Shunammite. Is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with your son? She said, It is well. It's all about your perspective. When you look at situations that are impossible, even a dead dead boy, you say, it is well. You talk about faith. And then she lets the prophet know what has happened, but it's still well. The prophet makes his way. He tells Gehazi, I think it's Gehazi, go and lay the rod on his body. And Gehazi goes and lays the rod on his body and nothing happens because the rod speaks of the law. So Elisha walks into the chamber. He says, take the young man, put him in my chamber. They lay his dead body out, and the prophet of God lays on him, puts his eyes on his eyes, mouth on his mouth, hands on his hands. All they're laying on that young man, and he sneezes seven times. And the Bible says, the boy comes alive. Take that that boy and puts her puts him in the arms of his mother who said it is well and there's an old song that we used to sing it is well with my soul it is well with my soul hallelujah to the Lord but that's a person who's learned to walk by faith and it's not pagan faith it's a real genuine trust and resting in God, even if you've got a dead baby in your arms. It is well. And God came through. The, Habak- the book of Habakkuk talks about 
a time in the history of the nation of Israel when everything was going wrong. Everything was bad. You've got a foreign power named Babylon marching throughout the world, or is it Syria, whichever one it was, marching through the world and destroying it. And the prophet goes to God and says, God, let me help you fix this. Let me tell you what I think should be done. How is it, God, that you would allow a pagan army to do this to even your own people? Don't understand. It can't be you, God. Fix this. Stop them. God said, no. You look at the world right now, and the world is crazy. It is insane. And you're saying, how can this continue? Why doesn't God stop this? I don't understand. That was Habakkuk. And God says to the prophet, he said, get to your tower where you can see God. And in the second chapter, the Bible said he got to his tower in a high place where he could see God. And the army kept marching. And nothing changed in the world. Everything was bad. But he saw God. And this is what he said. Although the fig tree, chapter 3 and verse 17, shall not blossom. I have an economic crisis in my life. There's an economic crisis in the world. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vine. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall, no, shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. He said, I'm looking at an empty refrigerator. I'm looking at an empty bank account. We have an economic crisis on our hands. The world is insane. It's messed up and God's not fixing it. He said, when I look at all of that, something changed in the prophet. Now he's not going to live by sight in this prophet, the just shall live by faith. He gets a hold of his faith. He sees not with his physical eyes from the tower, but he sees from the mind in his inner being. He may, takes his emotions to God, his choice to God, his feelings to God, his judgments to God. And he said, I don't think, see anything changing. It's all bad. Yet... I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. I got where I could see God in the spirit. He said, I started rejoicing. Brothers and sisters, he had a Pentecostal worship service like some of you've never done. Because I've never seen some of you jump up and spin around. The word rejoice means to leap up and spin around. That prophet up there in that tower was leaping up and spinning around and worshiping God. Yet shall I rejoice in the God of my salvation. It doesn't matter what it looks like. The world's gone crazy. It's an economic crisis. But I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to praise the Lord. It is well with my soul. What time is it? Ten? What time is it? I'm asking sincerely. Nine. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, see, here it is. This clock says 11.10. So that would make me think it's 10.10. But it's really what? Nine. Mm-hmm. We need to dust this for fingerprints. <laughs> What's going on here, you know? Do you understand? Do you get that? Yes. Yeah, okay. You look like you were confused. I'm saying I think if somebody's trying to tell me anyway. 
But I'm fixing to go through some verses here that are going to help you. So you understand it's not just your brain we're talking about. We're talking about your mind. So I'm going to go very, very quickly here. In Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, brethren, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, that's your material, that's your brain and your body, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, what we need is a transformation of our mind, our soul. Woo. So we renew our mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That means this, that when the world is coming after you and tempting you. And you're tempted to go to the world, another way of living. He said, you need to renew your mind. So the world doesn't win. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. But we all with open face beholding as a glass and the glory of the Lord are changed in the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. When you hone in on God and you pray and you worship Him, God is going to transform your mind. Your hormones are going crazy. But in your mind, you say it's all right. Because God has transformed your mind. You are being changed into his image. From glory to glory. Psalm 56, verse 3. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Amen. So verse 3 again, what time I'm afraid, I will trust in thee. Do you see that? That's what people of faith do. When they start having fears inside, don't understand. I'm going to trust in the Lord. I'm not going to tell him how to fix it. Second Chronicles. Amen. Chapter 6, verse 37. Yet if they bethink themselves in the land, whether they are carried captive and turn and pray into the land of their captivity, saying, we have sinned, we have done amiss, and have dealt wickedly. If they return to thee with all their heart, repentance, Turning back to God. With what? The heart. It's not the thing that pumps your blood. It's the innermost being. It's your mind. Your soul. Amen. You're making choices in the seat of your inner being. And that affects your brain. And that affects your body. If they return to thee with all their heart and with all their soul. It doesn't say their brain. In the land of their captivity where they have carried them captives and prayed toward their land. And thou givest unto their fathers toward the city which thou hast chosen. And toward the house which I have built for thy name. Then hear thou from heaven and from thy dwelling place their prayer and their supplication. And maintain their cause and forgive thy people who have sinned against thee. Repentance is in here, Amen. not here. Amen. Psalm 119. Verse 30. Psalm 119, verse 30 says it this way. I have chosen, that's the mind. I have chosen the way of truth. Thy judgments I have laid before, they have laid before me. So you make choices in the seat of your inner being. It's where you choose today. It's where I choose today. And he said, I chose the way of truth. Thy judgments have I laid before me. I have stuck Unto thy testimonies, O Lord, put me not to shame. I will run the way of thy commandments when thou shalt enlarge my heart. 
what actually enlarges your heart is when you walk in the commandments of God. It's a gravitas. Makes you large in spirit, large in God, large in soul. Amen? Okay. So I think I pretty much got it covered. May the Lord bless you and keep you is my prayer. What a great man of God. And I was going to read to you the text of the Shunammite, but God just quickened it in my spirit to give it to you. So let's stand. Father God, let us be transformed in our thinking and our mind, our heart, our soul, our will, our spirit. We make choices tonight by the inner man. We look to you by way of prayer and by transformation. Change us, God. As we yield to you. Transform our soul and spirit. As we yield to you God. Let us see. Beyond the natural. We give you all praise and glory. No matter what the trouble God. We will exercise true faith. Trust and rest in you. And not pagan faith. That says when I get my way. I give you all praise and glory and honor God. Use this church. Help this church. From the young people up, God. You are our identity. We consider you the author and the finisher of our faith. Hebrews says this. I need to read it to you. Talking about it in Hebrews chapter 12. Paul says this. Wherefore sin we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and sin which doth easily beset us. And let us run with patience. The race is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him. That endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. When you're struggling. In your mind. Consider Jesus Christ. Think about all the things he went through. All the suffering that he went through. And it will encourage you to remain faithful unto the Lord. It does not tell you to turn inward. So many people, they don't look to Jesus Christ. They don't turn to Him and look to Him with the inward man, the soul and the spirit. Then that affects the mind and the body. They turn inwardly. They get inward. Okay? That's not what you want to do. That's destructive. Ooh, did you hear that? That's destructive. And everything, go to God in prayer and rely upon the Spirit of God to come and transform you. Because you're going to have emotions at times you don't understand. You say, God, I don't know what's going on. I can't figure it out. It just, you know. Is it the meds I'm on? It's, is it my body? Is it my mind? Is it hormones? Is it caffeine? Or is it even that I've grieved your spirit by way of sin? Or, Lord, is it just, just something that's really not real? Is it phantom? Because in my inward man, it is well with my soul. So I pray this has been an encouragement to you. And, and listen to me, young people. You need this message tonight. Because Jesus Christ is your source of living and transformation and your identity. At the very beginning, I told you about the world. Is trying to take your dignity and cause you to embrace depravity. And they will celebrate you all day long. And they will talk about how great you are because you chose a so-called alternative lifestyle. And they will meet with you in the office, counselors, and will affirm that you're a this when you're not. And even give you hormones to change your gender. But the problem is they can never change your gender. They can only change your anatomy. 
But if you were born again, you'll be a girl until forever. If you were born a boy, you'll be a boy forever. It doesn't matter what they do to you anatomically. You will still be a girl or a boy depending on how you were born. And if you, in case you don't believe me, okay. Okay, now listen. Some of y'all are taking this maybe pretty lightly, but I'm, I'm hitting something here that's very important. Okay. You better pray over your kids every day before they go to school. And I'm not saying that's going on here, but listen. A boy, a, a, a boy that was born a boy cannot have a baby. I don't care what they do to change the body. Amen? Are you understanding that? And a girl can never sire a baby. They can do a double mastectomy. Is that how you say that? They can surgically remove body parts. They can give them hormones. But they'll never be able to produce a son. They will be sterile. And a, Are you with me? And a boy can never have a baby. No matter what they do anatomically to the body. They will be sterile. Okay? Everybody with me? So y'all, y'all be aware. man. Don't put your head in the sand. Ultimately, Jesus Christ is our everything. Amen. He was Paul's everything. So I love you. God bless you. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for being in the house of God. Amen.